Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to Slow Art Friday. My name is Paige Taylor, Learning and Engagement Assistant here at the Asheville Art Museum. And today I'm joined by Megan Pyle, our touring docent. Um, as you participate today, please remember to close the door um, and uh, participate in a quiet space and silence alerts from devices. Try not to sit in front of a bright light source. Use headphones and microphones for the best sound quality. Use a desktop, laptop, or tablet for the best viewing experience. And make sure that your screen name includes your first and last name or your first name and last initial. To ask questions or make comments, you can unmute your microphones, type into the chat box, or raise your hand. And we are recording, so if you prefer not to be part of that recording, you're welcome to turn your video and microphones off and participate through the chat box. Each Friday at 12 p.m., docents lead virtual interactive conversations about a few artworks in our collection or special exhibitions. The goal is simple. Slow down, discover the joy of looking at art, and talk about the experience with others. For today's program, Megan will lead us in an interactive conversation about three artworks in our special exhibition. We'll spend about 15 minutes or so with each artwork. Megan will allow us time to look at each artwork on our own slowly before leading a conversation about each one with questions. As participants, we encourage you to engage in dialogue with Megan, myself, and each other. Megan, what are we going to be talking about today? We can't hear her. Megan. We oh, here I am. Sorry about that. <laughs> well, good afternoon, everybody. I'm going to be taking a look at the museum special exhibition, um, Public Lands Photography, or Public Domain, excuse me, Photography and the Preservation of Public Lands, which unfortunately is closing today. So um, if y'all haven't had a chance to see it in the museum, um, we'll, we'll get to see some, some of the highlights here. Um, and I'm just especially excited to look at these today because of just where we live um, and kind of the beauty of, of Asheville. Um, but these, these artists, or um, in the case of these artists today, they're all photographers. Um, but these, um, these through images that capture the beauty changes and even devastation of the American landscape Photographers have played a vital role in protecting um, and advocating for the preservation of nature via the establishment and maintenance of state parks and national parks and monuments and other federally protected lands. And these artworks ask viewers to contemplate nature's beauty uh, and present a call to action to protect it. Um, and this year marks the 75th anniversary of the establishment of the U.S. Department of uh, the Interior Bureau of Land Management, uh, whose mission is to sustain health, diversity, and productivity of public lands for the use and enjoyment um, of present and future generations. So uh, I'm excited to be discussing these. And um, Paige, may we please see the first artwork? Oh, thank you. Okay, so we'll, we'll take a few moments to look at this um, top to bottom, side to side, corner to corner. Um, and I, I will tell you that um, in the museum, this photograph is, it's a small, it's, it's, it's a four by six photograph. Um, so we're we're lucky to get to be looking at it um, on our screens here. <laughs> um, okay, so what's going on in this artwork? I see a lot of texture and um, the, the sepia color kind of draws you in and um, it's, you see some 
sense of life because you see the tree in the right foreground and some branches, but yet it looks very barren. Okay, good. Yeah. What more can we find? There's no, well, there's a, oh, go ahead. There's Sam. a definite foreground and there's a definite horizon. Okay, good. No people, no one hiking, no animals, um, just, just the sky and like Sandy said, the, the mountains and, and the foreground. Okay, good. And Renee also commented in the chat box that she sees clouds, um, what look like clouds in the sky. Um, okay, good. And I'm noticing the play of light. The sun is coming coming from my right. Uh, I don't know if that's the west or the east. Um, and the shadows. And I love the silhouettes of the trees. Okay, good. It almost looks like a national park, maybe, to me. Okay, good. So do, how does it make um, the viewer feel? I mean, do you feel, does it make you feel small <laughs> looking at this vast expanse? I just feel expanded. Okay. That my mind can blow up with this picture. Yeah. So have, um, have you been to places like these? Well, I live in Montana, so I see a lot of mountains. And th though these look barren, I think it's because they're in a distance. And if we were flying over them, uh, I think we'd see a lot of greenery. Okay, good. I think of it an area too where you would want to go to be creative, almost to read or to paint or to write. Okay, good. So is that how you feel when, when you're in places like these? I think so. I mean, I've been to um, the Grand Canyon and Arches and Zion, and um, it's just very, when you're there, especially coming from a more crowded Northeast kind of area to see such expansive land and mountains and things like that, even if it is a little barren in this picture, it's just um, this mind want to think kind of thing. And Renee comments, um, it, makes, it makes them feel that there are possibilities and places to explore. So what, um, what sounds do you think you would hear if you're in this, this setting where the photograph was taken? Well, well nature is very noisy <laughs> and yet the wind is not blowing here and that makes a lot of the noise. Um, the sound of the force of birds, I, you know, I don't know. It, it just feels like quiet and solitude. It's hard. It's hard to picture sounds of nature with this for me. Okay. I agree because there's no planes flying over. There's no birds. You don't see any animals or people that would be like crunching on the ground, so to speak. So it's kind of what they say, like crickets, just very quiet. 
Yeah. But we, there might be a stream down at the bottom of the canyon or a river, and we might hear that. And actually, could that be a lake on the far right, on closer to the bottom? Would you like to zoom in? Yes, please. The bottom right? Yes. Yes. Do you see how that could possibly? Yes, I think that is a lake. I mean, it is the low area, it looks like. Although the mountain area looked more sandy, so to speak, than <laughs> greenery, you know. So how does the, how do the mountains look? I know out west, um, and particularly in Colorado, you can see a lot of damage done um, from mining to the, and some you've described these mountains as barren. Do they, they look like they've been um, damaged in some way by mm. activity or? That's a possibility. It just seems like they're too high to be where they mined. Uh, I, I thought the altitude was higher. Okay, good. Yeah. Well, so what do you think, um, what smells would you smell? <laughs> Well, I'd like to think that I smell um, a breeze and freshness. Um, I, I like to think that this could be early morning, so it's not hot, hot yet. So that it's more crisp. Okay, good. Yeah, I think Laurel um, commented on the texture. What? What textures do you think you would feel? Well, because or perhaps of, rockiness, you mean, if you were doing a walk around here? Right. Yeah, on your feet or with your hands sort of touching, like what you think it's well, rocky on your feet? Both. I, you know, you can feel that rock. Um, still in the foreground. And, and I do think this is rocky on the feet. I'd be using my walking poles. <laughs> <laughs> Trekking sticks. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, especially an uneven surface. And I mean, uh, with the, the almost like debris and brush and um, some of the trees and the branches. And it doesn't look like a very safe area to be walking around in. Okay, good. So what about um, balance? Is the composition balanced? You've got the very dark in the foreground there and then it lightens up in the middle, as Sandy said, the three kind of layers or levels and then very light. Although I'm almost wondering if it's not morning Christmas, but maybe smoggy air pollution. I don't know. Mm -hmm. Okay, good. So does anyone else have a comment about the, the balance of the composition? I guess the two trees, the one in the right foreground at the angle to the one that's green and just poking up on the left there, that's kind of interesting. Well, and at the center, you see the pointed um, mountain that's not the highest and it's right at the center and it's um, forming a triangle right in the center. Um, I, I think that this is balanced because of the, the strong diagonal going from the left to the right at the first hill. And then, um, then the diagonals moving up on the other side. I think it's beautiful the more we talk about it. 
and it's to me very crisp um and because of the the blurry mountains in the distance they're just very far away i'm wondering what kind of equipment or how far away the photographer was if this was with a wide angle or a zoom or um how how close or far to, to get this type of oh, oh. I don't know, in a hot air balloon. I don't know how they got this picture. <laughs> okay, good. So what do you, do you think this photograph has a message or a meaning? Well, you are making me wonder, you know, in Montana, there are hill mountainsides that are all rocky. And at the bottom is where they did mine especially Butte, Montana. Um, you're making me wonder about mining country um, and, dis and the destruction that was caused there. You are, you are planting seeds and maybe that's, that was why this is in the exhibit. Well, has anyone ever um, been on a scree slope? It's just sort of like the side of a you know, side of a mountain where you can, it's just like loose rock and you can just sort of slide down. You just sort of have your feet like this and you just, you just slide down. Uh, has anybody ever experienced a scree slope? Yes, during a hike in the Sierras in California. Hmm. Fun and scary. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Well, um, so if you could choose a title for this artwork, what would it be? I think I might call it the Great Expanse or something like that. Okay, good. Okay, good. Well, um, if there are no other comments, uh, may we see the label, please, Paige? Here's the photographer. His name is George Massa, and the photograph was taken in 1920. And, um, and so y'all can see the camera that he's using and, and you can imagine how cumbersome um, that must have been to, to carry and do on hikes in the mountains and to photograph. Um, do we know where it was taken? Do we know, I know it's on title, but do we know the location of the, the, the photograph? Well, um, I don't know, um, but I would guess the, the Smoky Mountains, but, but it also could have been the Blue Ridge here. Um, uh, Paige, do you know? I'm not sure. Okay. What would be well, fascinating would be to have that picture, that same location taken today, just for a comparison. It would, it would. Um, and, and George Masa, he was uh, born in Japan in the early 1880s. His name was uh, Masahara Isuka, and very little is known about his early life. Um, but after his father's death, he immigrated to the United States and studied engineering at the University of California before moving to North Carolina to work at the Grove Park Inn in Asheville. And in Asheville, um, he joined the Carolina Mountain Club and was exposed to the area's spectacular scenic beauty. And, and though it is unclear how he learned photography, he eventually became quite skilled as a cameraman and he went to work for a photography studio and then eventually became a proprietor. 
but he's best known for extensively photographing and mapping the Blue Ridge Mountains, often in concert with his friend, naturalist and author Horace Keppert. And together the pair tirelessly promoted the region and people, and they were instrumental in the creation of the Great Smoky Mountains National Park. Um, and Massa presented a book of his photographs of the region to Grace Coolidge, the wife of Calvin Coolidge, uh, who was a frequent visitor to the area and helped spur the founding of the park. Um, he, Massa died in 1933. Um, but many of uh, Massa's photographs, maps, and other personal papers are held by the Buncombe County Library and UNC Asheville and Western North Carolina University. Um, and um, his work was really essential to the transformation of parts of the region into the federally protected Great Smoky Mountains National Park. And in 1961, there was an unnamed peak um, that is now, now known as Masa Knob. Um, so, well, um, may we see the next artwork, please? Okay, and please take a few moments to look at this um, kind of top to bottom, side to side, corner to corner. Um, And I will tell you that this photograph, um, or these photographs are, they're, they're the same subject um, that they were just taken um, years apart. So there, one was taken in 2006 um, and the other was taken in 2018, so. I love that Laurel suggested that and then not knowing we, you had this photo prepped be the next one. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, so what's what's going on in in, in these photographs, or if, if you want to comment, you know, on them individually. Well, I like the one on my right where it's showing the reflection in the water and the lighting. I, I think that's quite intriguing. And the one on the left is just, you can see ripples in the water and there's some shadow, but it's not exactly um, that duplicative reflective um, there. Okay, good. And Renee commented in the chat box, there's less vegetation on the right. So that must mean that the one on the left is the oldest and trees have fallen down and the grasses have gotten uh, a lot more. Um, I, like, I like the contrast between the two because uh, the right is still, and the left is windy, and there's a lot more shade in the back on the on the left. There's a lot more shade in the back of the the grove on the other side of the river or the marsh. Um, so it's taken at, at different weather conditions, and it took me a while to figure out which was the oldest picture. And Renee also comments that it looks like there's less vegetation on the photo on the right. Yeah. And there's no ducks. There's no <laughs> birds. Yeah, the absence of animal life or people throwing stones or fishing or I don't even know if you would boat here, but and the absence of any kind of waterfowl or any birds in the air is just kind of, uh, it makes you wonder. So it's, um, it's sort of, there's an absence of, well, it's, it's similar sort of 
to the first photograph that we looked at, the George Massa, um, but some of you commented that that was peaceful. Does this, does this, or, or that, you know, there was solitude and you could imagine, you know, reading a book or painting or drawing um, in the setting in the George Massa photograph. How about these photographs that are similarly kind of desolate or quiet or solitude? But how do these make you feel? I don't know, this makes me feel a little more lonely <laughs> as opposed to expansive. It just um, a little more like there I am just all alone. And living in Montana, I seek out being alone. So I, I appreciate this and it makes me think about the coastline of North Carolina and South Carolina, or maybe it's more in North Carolina, where there are so many inlets and islands. And I mean, this could be so many places, couldn't it? Mm -hmm. Absolutely, yes. Just like an intercoastal waterway, you know, North Carolina, South Carolina, Georgia, Florida. Absolutely. It's it reminds me of the novel, Where the Crawdads Grow. Oh, could you tell us? I've never heard of that. Oh, that's a very popular one a few years ago. Oh. Um, oh, yes. I highly recommend it. I think it was Oprah's book club also, besides my book club. And it's a wonderful read, especially for a woman. But I do know a lot of men who enjoyed it, too. And it takes us to this this place. The woman who wrote it um, lives up in Idaho on the panhandle with lots of land. She was popular uh, living in Africa writing about nature with her husband and she grew up in this area and she's so able to write about nature that you get a great read on the land and there's a mystery in it and a romance in it and a lot of solitude. Uh, I highly recommend it. Where the crawdads live. I have to look it up. And so what about um, the, again, the, the texture? How, how do you think it would feel if you were walking, walking around on this land? Think it's possible to access it? It's not good hiking land. <laughs> I can't even imagine. I'd be on a boat exploring it, not in, not on the land. And think about beaver and beaver. And think about snakes and maybe alligators and crawdads. <laughs> Plus, it's interesting to think of nature like taking care of itself. I don't imagine that um, this is manicured or taken care of by man at all so, or woman. Good point. What would it sound like if you were in the boat? What sounds would you hear? You might hear the water like frogs or, or certain animals that live in the water. And you might even hear, like Sandy said, the snakes or any of those kind of, um, even though we don't really see them, they could definitely be there. Okay. And turtles on the logs. And lots of birds. So have any of you all been to places like like this? Well, I sometimes vacation in the bayous of Southwest Arkansas. Um, so it's, it's more swamp. There's not big rivers, um, but it reminds me of that. I don't see knuckles coming out of the water, but it's buggy and it's humid. I also got uh... The feeling of um, humidity and bugginess too. 
In Cape Cod, there would be things similar, but definitely not as tall. I mean, I don't know the name, if this foliage has a name, how tall these things are that look like rough and furry or what have you. But in Cape Cod, you would see some marshes and inlets and little things like this, but not mm. as high. It reminds me of visiting Florida, especially with the picture on the right that has, looks like it has more palm trees. Mm -hmm. Okay, good. So do you think that um, these photographs have a meaning or a message? For me, they're, they're a map of history because I'm thinking about global warming. I'm thinking about how this will be submerged. And I'm also thinking about, I saw the news a couple nights ago where dead fish were happening in, in zillions. And uh, it was on the west side of Florida, along Tampa Bay. And here was a time when maybe the water was more pure and nature was more healthy. And I feel that in both pictures still. Michelle also commented that it reminds her of Florida where she spent um, a lot of time. Uh, Michelle, do you wanna clarify when you say that's our red tide or explain if, if you're able? Uh, hello, um, yeah, in, in Florida, we have uh, usually a, I'm trying to think if we did we have blooms, last year. Yeah, they're algae blooms and they definitely come on the West Coast. Can't speak about the Atlantic Ocean, but I don't think so. I think it has more to do with the warmer waters in the Gulf. But living in Tampa Bay, yeah, we just came out of a pretty horrific red tide. It had not been that bad in years. Mm -hmm. And um, Tampa Bay is unique in that you've got, you know, the Tampa side, has its own kind of peninsula and then you kick across uh, Tampa Bay and then you're in Pinellas County. And then if you drive, continue driving to the very west end of Pinellas County, you're literally, you know, at the Gulf of Mexico. So yes, we did. It was, you know, it was devastating to see all the wildlife, uh, the fish that had died because of it. But in normal times, you know, like when I look at these photos, to me, it felt, it feels very Florida. But this could be anywhere in the South. I agree, it could be anywhere and it could be entitled not forever because either Beautiful. land is gonna go away or the water is gonna go away. And it could be representative to me, like out West, um, mead is is like dried up almost and um it's all just the water's gone and yet on the northeast the hudson river's polluted so between pollution or the water being too high or too low or as the red tide or any of these other um typhoons or natural disasters that we have um i would say what you see is not going to be there forever Mm -hmm. So does this land, I mean, does it look like it's worth preserving? You know, we like, like thinking about the George Massa photograph and how, um, you know, he was sort of instrumental in protecting the mountains here and the creation of the Great Smoky Mountains National Park. And do you think this photograph is what it is like entice a call to action for people to want to preserve and protect this land? Well, I could, I could say I, the water needs to be protected. We don't want our waterways polluted, but I look at this as so much shoreline that it's more or less protected if we don't, um, as long as we do protect the water. Okay, good. I, I personally find that, I mean, I think exhibits are important and awareness, movies, the whole bit. And I think it kind of starts to 
maybe put a seed into someone's mind. Um, but I personally feel, and just my personal experience with myself and with others that I've witnessed, that until you actually immerse someone into nature, they're, they're not going to care in general. I'm just saying, but I, you know, I feel it's important that, you know, the art that points out the devastation of this planet, mm -hmm. it serves as a seed. I don't feel it typically moves many people to do anything about it um, until they experience, until they personally have an experience with nature that makes them feel what it's like to, um, to lose it. Okay, good. And, and do you think these photographs might, um, someone might be moved to visit this, this natural landscape and, this, and then maybe then from that, they might have an experience and kind of feel a connection to the land. Uh, I, I think the, the big question is preserving the globe. Isn't that more? And this is a baby step if you're in a canoe um, paddling around. Um, but I, I think the big picture is preserve the earth. Okay, good. But Sandy, do you feel that it's almost like, think about like um, a stone dropping into a river, right? You have that ripple effect that you almost need to have every individual in their own communities take interest mm -hmm. in their own communities. Oh, yes. That, we, that, have, we have three rivers running through our community and they are recreation and they are, we do cleanup. Yeah, I, people own the community. It, it's, the, it's these two pictures where they're so, to me, expansive uh, and the shore is so huge that it's hard for me to look at this and say, preserve this spot. Um, I know that beavers destroy these kinds of places by eating the trees and knocking them in the water so that I know of spots where they're actually killing beaver to keep their swamp. Um, I always want people out in nature in any way they can. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, and well, and then do y'all think you'd view this differently if you were in color? In a poem, did you say? In color. Oh, in, in color. color. Well, I think they're very poetic. It would be nice to have a poem to go with them. <laughs> I love the black and white and I love the I love the two side by side very much. I agree on both of those with the black and white as well as the uh, side by side. And you you don't want to have anything polluted. I mean I know egrets eat frogs and there's that that chain in nature, you know, certain fish get eaten and other fish live because of it, so it's just but you don't want any fish or waterfowl or anything to become ill because um, the waters become polluted because of man-made things that get done. And you don't want fire there. And we're, we're on fire here. Okay. Just think about how long it takes along this area for trees to grow. You know, the think about the soil, it's sandy, it's salty. That These are probably very old trees and they're not gonna regenerate in the blink of an eye. No, no, you're exactly right. Yeah. So this is hurricane area, wouldn't you say? Where the winds can blow them down? I would say so, yes, yes. Good. Well, does anybody else have a comment they'd like to make? I was just gonna add, I know um, 
our exhi this exhibition isn't up for much longer, but when you were talking about color and black and white, these prints are so beautiful in person. Um, I think we're going to find out in a moment they're toned, which gives them this um, sort of coolish um, color in the in the gray tones. And um, even though I generally prefer color photographs, these black and white prints are gorgeous if you have a chance to see them in person while they're still up. Okay. I, I own two gorgeous black and whites of Swampland. And you're, you're making me want to just go look at them and appreciate them in a way that I never have before. So thank you very much. Okay, you're welcome. Well, may we see the label, please, Paige? So the title is Roof View. Um, and and uh, the first photograph was taken in 2006 and the second one was taken in 2018. And it's a selenium toned gelatin silver print. Um, but I will tell you, um, and you may have to help with the pronunciation, but um, the photographer Benjamin Dibbett, he first visited the estuary in Chaza Zika National Wildlife Refuge north of Tampa, Florida oh. um, in 1977. And then in 2004, he began photographing the semi-tropical forest, but noticing in 2014, the impact that the encroaching saltwater caused to vegetation as hardwood trees died off and the grasses and palm trees took over. So he began to return regularly to locations for photographs taken as far back as 30 years ago to make new exposures that reveal shifts in the landscape. These ghost forests of sparse palms and hardwood skeletons can be found increasingly along the Gulf and East Coast. Uh, but Benjamin Dibbett was born and raised on the Gulf Coast of Florida. Um, and he studied photography uh, at Eckerd College in St. Petersburg, Florida, but also um, in Florence, Italy, and London, England, uh, and also in, in New York. Um, and he's taught photography in New York. He taught photography in New York City um, been for many years, but he recently moved from New York City to Asheville, and he teaches at Bascom Art Center in Highlands, North Carolina. So, um, so that's something that I love about the Asheville Art Museum is, is we always have so many local connections um, to all of our artists. So, okay, uh, may we see the next artwork, please? So now we're in color. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. So, um, but if y'all would just be, take a few moments to look at this. Um, Top to bottom, side to side, corner to corner. Uh, so where is your eye drawn first in this photograph? My eye is drawn to the um, reddish type um, jagged stump. Yes, exactly. And it looks to me almost as if the colors have been um, doctored on this photo, just so to speak, like in Photoshop or something because, or equivalent, the greens just look too green and the trees just look too rusty red to me. Okay, good. I have to say I love the top and the contrast with, uh, oh, you know, the border that comes along with the white flowers. That's just drop dead gorgeous. The whole thing is gorgeous. Okay, good. I myself personally have actually witnessed this vibrancy 
on hikes in this area. Um, so to me, I don't, I mean, it could be doctored, but when I initially look at it, it pulls me into, you know, a certain time of day with, you can see the sun hitting that um, deteriorated uh, tree remnant. Okay, and cool. that is creating that vibrancy because mm -hmm. that is actually what happens when you're walking at certain times of day in forest and mm -hmm. um, wildflower fields. I agree that the that the photo or the image looks super saturated, but um, since you brought that up, Michelle, I, I'm kind of remembering. Um, like when the sun comes out after a rain and you get these sort of like heightened, bright, saturated colors all over everything. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, Paige, it's so funny. A friend and I <clears throat> and my partner and another friend, we were, the four of us were hiking on just this past Sunday, um, more around Weaverville. And we were literally just having that discussion about how right after it rains, like the green is mm -hmm. so vibrant. Like it's just so obvious. It's, um, yeah, that's interesting you brought that up. Okay, good. I do like the yellow in the background, the sunlit background. I, I think that that's very nice. Um, I just wondered why the trees are so rotted. They don't look healthy, but yet the grass and the flowers do. I don't know. And do the flowers, do they look like, um, do they look like wildflowers that would naturally be in the forest floor? Or um, I thought maybe they looked like, um, you know, daffodils, like bulbs that had been, that, you know, would be planted sort of, you know, man-made, um, if you will, kind of, you know, subdivisions. Um, so I'm, I'm wondering what you all think about that. If, does it look natural to you? Um, or do those flowers look like they belong in this forest? When I hike around and see a pile of like daffodils and then an old remnant of a building, um, they're, they're not scattered. And so that makes me think that, you know, that, that this is a place where I don't live and that this is their natural wildflower. Okay, does anybody else? Can anybody else speak to that? They do look like daffodils to me, but I guess that could be natural or not. Or you almost feel like maybe someone came in at some point in time and had planted some flowers around here. And the sense I get is you just see the power of nature in its ability to rebirth itself. And so you almost feel like someone had started, a human had started something and then nature just took over. Okay, good. I agree with Michelle that, that initially someone probably planted some flowers there and then they just kept continuing and growing and uh, flourishing. Okay. Yes, nature is very prolific. I actually love the contrast, um, and maybe the photographer was purposeful in this, of the decay, you know, just showing how, you know, nature um, cycles, you know, that this, this, this cycle of nature that is in all of us, because we're nature, of death and rebirth, feels very prevalent in this photograph to me. Okay, good. And it was interesting to hear the word uh, flourishing used to describe this photograph, because if we think about the others that we've looked at, um, I don't believe flourishing 
or rebirth um, or even vibrancy. Of course, the other photographs were black and white, but um, so it's an interesting contrast with this photograph. Um, so how does this photograph make you feel sort of compared to the other two? So, or the mood of this photograph, is it compared to the other two? Well, even though there's no people again or animals or anything, I would say this one would have more smell for me because I would could sit on one of those um, parts of a tree and hope it didn't collapse. And I could smell the grass and smell the flowers and smell the air. And um, so I would think that this one would be more invigorating. Okay, good. Because of Michelle's comment, and I think hopeful when I look at the picture. I think you're um, more relatable and personable because you can imagine yourself there. And it could just be because of the proximity to it. We know where the others were photographed further away. You know, I feel that kind of has an influence on how we feel personally about what we're viewing. So the artist's perspective definitely draws us in and makes us feel like we're right there and, and thus giving us a more personal connection mm -hmm. to the artwork. Okay, good. Um, and then uh, what about the, the composition of this artwork or this photograph and the use of space? What do you think? I think it's done very well in that um, the art, the photographer can't pose this picture. In other words, you can't start moving around the, the, the trees and the sticks and the flowers and, and, and pose it. You just have to capture it. Mm -hmm. Okay, good. I'm sort of, I'm wondering what's on the other side of the, I imagine the top of the hill, if you look at the line going across the top, I want to know what's on the other side, it's sort of like that the pokey little puppy story. You know, pokey little puppy goes goes up the hill and then he's going down the other side. I wonder, if, does it if it looks the same with the same um, same flowers, carpet of flowers, or or if it's different. Mm -hmm. And I definitely want to go over that hill. <laughs> I just got a hit on um, the Wizard of Oz where they're walking along and then they meet the flowers that put them to sleep. <laughs> oh, right. Because I can see a trail. Uh, my eye just moves from the top and then across and then down. Sort of this yeah. kind of zigzag here? Yes. Or? Yes. Yeah? Yes. Oh, wow. And I call that great photography. Even though there isn't movement in the picture, my eye moves. Oh, I call that movement. Yeah. Yep. The more that I look at this, I feel like he was walking through here shortly after sunrise. Like you can see where the sun is coming in. Um, because the, the focus of this, to me, the focus of the photograph is, is that decayed um, tree piece and it's completely highlighted by the sun. So it almost feels like that moment in time when, you know, within an hour of sunrise, 
Yes, I, lo I love that um, now I see the path. I hadn't seen the path before. But it is interesting because the, I mm -hmm. mean, I'd like to ask the artist, mm -hmm. you know, is there some sort of decay going on? Um, you know, is there some sort of a, a pet, you know, a boar or something or some disease like um, that's killing the trees? Or is it just to show, you know, the, the rebirth of nature, you know, and just, you know, just the natural decay of, of a dead tree. Um, you know, did the tree die of natural causes, so to speak, or, um, you know, cause it does seem that that's the, um, the artist's sort of focal point is that, is that tree. But I do get a glowy, warm feeling to the picture too, even though it may be early in the morning, still the sun coming up and the glowy type um, shadowing. But also um, I could see maybe some kind of insect infestation killing the trees. Mm. Okay. Well, I Googled, I Googled where wild daffodils grow and, <laughs> and it's wet woodlands. So oh. you could you could imagine the musty smell, and also in meadows. And they said specifically Nantucket, um, in America. Oh wow, well. that's great. Thank you. Well, um, well, may we please see the label page? So this is uh, Robert Glenn Ketchum, um, and he's got, there's a quote, I'll read a quote from here. He was, he was born in 1947 and he's, he's still living. He says, we can't say that we want better lives for our children and ourselves and then not become active in the legal and political system. Personal responsibility for lifestyle is only a single component of a complex puzzle. We must also advocate on behalf of the habitat that supports us or it won't continue to. Um, but a lot of his photographs um, are colorful landscapes that depict changing leaves, blossoming flowers and discarded tires contrasting pristine nature with man-made refuse. And like these images, Ketchum aims to both celebrate and integrate the stewardship of the federal government, taking Cuyahoga Valley National Park in Ohio as his case study. Because the Bureau of Land Management's average at times allows for private use natural resource management in certain areas, Mismanagement of these lands through poor public policy or neglect has led to erosion, deforestation, overgrazing, and other devastations. Um, so. I just wanted to say, if you back up and look at this from a distance, the central um, point is the two skinny trees to the right of the, the red um, stump. And it's pretty fascinating. You mean here? Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> wow. Mm. Wow. Wow, what great conversations we've shared today. And thank you all so much for participating. And all your comments were so insightful and uh, sparked a meaningful discussion. Um, I always learn, I always see something new um, every time. Uh, so I'm so glad you joined me. Um, and thank you so much, Paige. And thank you, Megan, for selecting these artworks to share with us today and leading our conversation. And thank you to everyone for um, making this, for participating and making this a great discussion. I hope you'll join us next week on August the 6th as our docent um, Doris Potash will lead us in a discussion with the theme of celebrating Olympians. So uh, everyone have a great weekend and we hope to see you again next week. Bye-bye. Okay.